Minister, hello. Uh, I'm going to be moderating. If you'd like, to, you can stand up there. You can walk around if you want, but no more than five minutes. That's four minutes plus one. Okay. Otherwise, I'll have to look at you. <laughs> I will not be the I'm the moderator. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'm Hello, welcome, yeah. welcome.
company. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting to see if I can persuade other people to come in. So, just be patient, please. Why are we getting French translation here? <clears throat> I'm proposing to start, even though some people... Is that better? Oui, c'est bon. Vous voulez que je parle en français et vous traduisez en anglais? But we, we don't need that translation. That means that lunch won't be until half past one, but there'll be plenty of lunch. It's been arranged, so don't think that you're going to miss out and go hungry, certainly in this part of uh, Vienna. Um, my name is Nick Gowing. What I'm here to do is make sure that we can drive this discussion uh, very uh, positively in a forward direction um, about re-evaluating existing threats, their nature and consequences to identify solutions, particularly on the UN plan of action in the digital age, tackling new challenges. We need to identify what those new challenges are um, and whether the new atmosphere is conducive to the freedom of expression. You'll all have heard overnight that Elon Musk is firing most of the people who work uh, for Twitter, particularly the BBC says um, from their, uh, from their uh, correspondent in Silicon Valley, those involved in the moderating process which was set up. So for $44 million billion, what has he created? Has he created something rather different? In other words, this is moving as we stand here and sit here uh, in Vienna for this conference. First of all, though, two um, expressions from ministers. First of all, uh, from Lithuania, the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jovita Neliupisneni, welcome. And, and then we'll have uh, from uh, Sierra Leone, uh, the Minister, the Deputy Minister of Information. So, Minister, please. Excellencies, dear ladies and gentlemen, I was told that we have a very limited time here, but uh, we have a very precious topic. I'd like to, to thank UNESCO, uh, uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, and Austria, of course, for organizing this event on the, and uh, selecting the very interesting topic. Lefina has a history of uh, serving as a safe haven uh, for the persecuted members of Belarusian civil society, including independent media like Nasha Niva, Tutbai. We, uh, uh, with the start of Russian aggression against Ukraine and Putin's crackdown on the civil society, NGOs, and free media, many uh, Russian journalists joined their Belarusian colleagues in, uh, in Lithuania in exile. W what happened actually? Everything, what they do, or most of the things they do, actually, those journalists being from Belarus, being from, uh, uh, from, uh, from Russia, or right now women journalists fleeing from, uh, from Ukraine to Lithuania, most of them are actually managed to work there, to do their job as the journalists. How they do that job? They do it online. And probably this is the only way how can actually access uh, the, the audience. What happens if we take the, uh, the numbers, actually the audience and the need uh, for the information on what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Russia, what's happening in, in Belarus is quadruple in one month only since the start of, uh, of the war. And this is uh, really the 
uh, their societies, the civil societies within those countries, but as well, if we look to their, what kind of audience uh, which is searching the information, be it uh, Belarusian media, be it uh, Russian language, Lithuanian uh, media, mostly uh, their society, of course, the people from those countries, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, but as well, you won't believe, from Germany, from Poland, from Austria as well, maybe not so big numbers. The thing is that there are many people spread around who are actually craving for information and the audience online actually are growing uh, quite uh, fast. Democratic governments and um, organizations, of course, are doing qu quite a lot to secure uh, the voice of the independent uh, media online. We applaud, of course, the Media Freedom Coalition, Freedom Online Coalition, and other initiatives uh, to support uh, those activities because without the financial support uh, and without the public-private uh, partnership, it's probably uh, uh, impossible to ensure. At the same time, authoritarian regimes the ones uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Russia, Belarus, China, Iran, you can may, uh, name uh, many more, actually are trying to use information technologies to their advantages in controlling public access to internet, free media online, using IT surveillance, uh, targeting independent journalists and other media workers for the online uh, harassment. Uh, uh, and this is one of the biggest probably challenge Sometimes you have actually, in order to be silenced, you don't need to be put in jail. You can be just cut off online. This is, uh, this is how uh, it's done, and it's very fast. If, uh, if you're, uh, if you're, and sometimes even when the media works on, uh, in exile in Lithuania or in other neighboring countries, if we are talking about media from Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, actually sometimes they are switched off. And the people in Russia cannot get access to their free media uh, anymore and the information and accurate information. And definitely the, another challenge, as we were uh, asked to speak about, is actually a challenge of uh, propaganda, disinformation, accompanied by surveillance and uh, repression, as well as, of course, uh, offensive uh, digital restrictions against uh, uh, independent media uh, outlets. And once again, what happens with uh, propaganda online? If you spread lies in a printed media or other traditional media, it takes some time to spread. What happens with the online propaganda? In a couple of seconds, <laughs> you can get access to millions uh, of, uh, of the audience. And this is the question actually to, uh, uh, to work on. The uh, third uh, thing which we sometimes uh, uh, have, it takes time for the different governments and uh, NGOs uh, to, to evaluate is actually that media outlets are unduly restricted by unreasonable legislation regarding funding sources, calling them foreign agents, state secrets, uh, extremism, counterterrorism, and uh, uh, arbitrary application of those kind of the, uh, legal uh, restrictions. Uh, so I, I do believe that there are lots of uh, challenges we face. Uh, they are a little bit different, but uh, uh, not uh, totally online and um, uh, and uh, and uh, and offline, there is uh, a specific uh, a specific challenge actually for women uh, journalists. Uh, they are not only uh, journalists who are facing harassment, but lots of uh, when we see the cases, they're mostly uh, women uh, harassment. And on top of that, when we have a huge movement of people coming from the conflict uh, regions, we see that it's mostly women journalists, women journalists, refugees. So we actually have even. Uh, uh, on top of that, more complicated uh, story. So what we can do, of course, we can. Uh, we have a prerogative and uh, imperative to implement UN uh, plan of actions on the safety of, of journalists, and we cannot do uh, uh, alone. None of the stakeholders can do that alone. Only joint actions uh, can uh, work. So uh, thank you very much, and I wish you uh, a successful discussion. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> Thank you very much. Solomon Jamiru, of the Deputy Minister of Information for Sierra Leone. I'm pushing the pace because we're way behind and I'm determined we'll get a lot in before 1.30. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to lend my perspective to the discussion and the presentation today. And I take the opportunity to thank the organizers. Um, first, on Sierra Leone's experience, I would first of all want to briefly mention two important guarantees for journalists. First is that in our section 11 of our constitution, it provides that journalists should be free in upholding the objectives of the constitution. 
but also be free to hold government accountable. That section 11 is not justiciable, but section 25 of the Constitution, which is actually part of the fundamental human rights and freedoms, is actually justiciable. And that one talks about freedom of expression and of the press, which as we all know is in line with Article 19 of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. But we have realized in Sierra Leone that having provisions in the Constitution would not be sufficient. And so we had this 55-year-old law on defamatory and seditious libel, which was actually criminalized. And so because of that, it hindered the works of journalists, whether it's offline or online. So consistent with his campaign promise, the President Julius Madabio in 2020 championed the repeal of, of, of defamatory and seditious libel. And as I am talking, we no longer have defamatory and seditious libel criminalized, and that enhances the work of journalists, whether it's offline or online. So because of the repeal of criminal and seditious libel, our human rights ranking, our ranking on protecting the rights of journalists have actually gone up. But in addition to that also, Sierra Leone took the <clears throat> an important step in November 2021 to sign up to the Global Pledge on Media Freedom. And because of the signing up of that pledge, we are essentially sending a message um, to our people that we are interested in protecting the rights of journalists at home, but also standing in solidarity with the world to protect journalists wherever they are in the world. It's, it's also important for me to say, as we talk about digital rights, of course, we have to make sure that it's balanced with digital responsibilities. So as a country and with the help of the European Union and the Council of Europe, we have been able to enact the cybersecurity and crime law um, in 2020, um, recognizing that it is important to broaden and enhance um, digital interaction, but it is also important for those who interact in the digital space to understand that they also have rights and, um, um, and responsibilities. So our ambition in enacting the cybersecurity and crime law is actually to establish that fine balance between the rights or the, the privileges that we all have to interact digitally, but also to bear in mind that where our rights stop, that's where the rights of others would begin. So within this, we have been able to conduct training for journalists to have a thorough sense of what this law is about, but also we have realized through some diagnostic um, surveys that digital literacy has been a fundamental gap for Sierra Leone, and it is important not just for the wider citizenry, but also for journalists to be exposed to the tools to empower them and ensure that they have some digital leverage to help them in reporting. I am pleased to note that for Sierra Leone, we have also been able to set, set up the National Coordinating Committee on the Safety of Journalists. So that is why yesterday, together with my colleague, we are part of the team to look at um, countries where this is not yet formalized and we are willing, um, should anybody here be disposed to, to sharing with us best practices wherever you are on formalized um, safety mechanisms for journalists, we'll be pleased to take that on board. Um, finally, wrapping up, um, I am pleased that yesterday we had examples from um, um, Pakistan, but also on the Digital Services Act. And I think these are two instructive instruments that I will go back home and share with colleagues. Because for Pakistan, I think why this is important, I learned um, two or three years ago that they had a bill on protection of journalists and media practitioners, which they took to parliament. I'm not yet sure whether that has been approved. So I think one important thing is then it gives us the impression that having a constitutional provision alone is not sufficient, but if you have an enabling legislation that speaks to the protection of journalists, I think that's important. And also together with the Digital Services Act, I think these are two emerging best practices that we would wish to borrow from, and we're looking forward to learning more from our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. <clears throat> As you, can, as you can see, we've got four guests here. We also have two down the line, and they're each going to speak for about four minutes, so you can work out the mathematics. I really do have two microphones. Hopefully, you can contribute as well. Uh, you can keep going through lunchtime if you want. I'm happy to stay here, but it's up to you and your stomach as to whether, as whether you dis disappear at half past one. I'm, just going to, I, I'm not just a moderator. I'm actually someone who's been on the road for a, an awful long time. Some of you may recognize me from the BBC. But I just want to reinforce what Jasper said literally before we come in, in here. We all need these new ideas more than ever. We are, uh, are you willing to do it? 
And that's where we are now with, with digital. Um, I've been on the road for a long time, but I want to take you back to 1993 when uh, Rory Peck, a cameraman, was killed outside Ostankino TV Center in Moscow. Um, I was one of the founding members of the Rory Peck Trust, which worked to protect large numbers of people using video, analog video in those days, who were taking enormous risks, and many of them got killed. We have a, an annual list of people who've been killed. Um, I, I was also involved in the International New Safety Institute and the setting up of that. But I, let me tell you, the sight of that flak jacket is something I want to emphasize to people who've never been on the road before. I've actually been on six hostile environment training courses. I was lucky to work for two large news organizations, Independent Television News and the BBC, who believed very strongly that if they were sending people into harm's way, they had to, be, they had to fund good training and put, put people like me in a position where we made a decision as to whether we went down that road and whether we took the risk. And they would send out uh, advisors with us as well. Most journalists we're talking about here don't have that luxury. Their organizations don't have the money. The funding is, is very different, is very difficult. So, you know, the... the I, my life has been saved at least a couple of times by this. So if, if you're looking at what is going on and the danger that there is out there and the need for this, it's even greater. The kind of things which led to us setting up the Rory Peck Trust are the same now as they were in 1993. And that's scary. Except that the volume, the, the multitude of what is needed is even greater. Um, I, I want to underscore one, one important issue, which in my view, having been on the road for a long time, is important. It's not just the safety of journalists. It's about how you define journalists now. And secondly, it's about the safety of journalism. It's about the ability of the media to protect democracy. And you've therefore got to underscore, underline, and question where that information is coming from in a time of crisis. Um, imagine what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Yemen. You've got people who use this for their grandchildren. They get up in the morning, they don't realize that maybe they're going to be under attack later in the day. They use their phone to be digital recorders, what I call information doers. So they've gone from using something which was a domestic tool to something which becomes critical to understanding what is happening in places like Ukraine, in places like uh, even in January the 6th, two years ago in, in Washington, giving an insight into places where even journalists couldn't go, get to. But they, in my view, and I warned about this in a Reuters paper 10 years ago, they are members of the media. So I would ask you in the next 10 years, in the next year, we've got to, we've got to frame this in a very different way, understanding that many of the people who are providing great data, great video, the kind of things which big broadcasting organizations are using, is being provided, providing they've got electricity and uplinks is being provided by people who have no clue as to what being a journalist is, but they record it. And they put themselves in harm's way as a result. They are therefore the victims of snipers, um, and they're victims of being targeted by police forces, and et cetera, et cetera. And I say that because many of them have lost their lives as well. Many of them have been injured too. And so what I, I'm, I'm doing this uh, as we move into the digital section on what we need to consider. My input is that we've got to consider um, how those kind of people can be looked after. It's, it's very, very difficult. But many have lost their lives recording stuff which we take for granted when we watch the 6 or the 8 or the 10 o'clock news. Um, and having a mobile phone creates a target. It's not just about me with a cameraman and a sound man where we're very visible. Someone with an iPhone is just as much a target these days. And you have to, um, you have to put that in, in, into uh, the factor. The, you have to factor that in. But the new skill in all of this is what the BBC calls, I don't work for the BBC anymore, the reality check system. And I think it's really important to underscore this to you. It is about a new form of media, which is examining all this stuff coming in, however it's, it's coming in. It's worth reading the BBC reality check columns on, online, because they explain, in a place like Iran, in a place like Iran now, how they validated the information, how they validated the video. That shows the importance of stuff which is uploaded, which no one knows when they've taken it, what is going to happen to it, but it can suddenly be, be being beamed around the world in an hour or two with enormous danger for them if they're traced. So this is moving in a very fast um, uh, moving uh, dynamic, 
which has been accelerated by the, the, the technology and also by the willingness of people to take risks, but people who do not see themselves as journalists. And that's why I'm putting it on the agenda, the questioning of whether it's just about safety of journalists. It is about the safety of something much more. And the, in the pre-day yesterday, we had to ask police, military, will they protect us? As someone said, crimes are inside governments. Will they really protect us? Interesting that Imran Khan yesterday, when he was attacked in Lahore, and okay, he was only injured in the shin, one of the things he said within a couple of hours, the ISI, the Pakistani military, were after me. And I'm just going to give you one sobering fact as well, because it's come up time and time again this morning and yesterday, about the attitude of the authorities to women. I come from London. The Metropolitan Police, the new commissioner, has now confirmed that several hundred police officers several hundred police officers now are, are abusing women online. I'll say that again, abusing women online. So imagine with the Sarah Everard case and so on, you cannot assume that those you're going to go to and, uh, uh, and hope that they will provide some kind of, um, uh, of, of good, good behavior and examination are going to actually do something with it. There's an active resistance, and the new commissioner has said, this has got to stop. Anyway, I've probably gone on for long enough, but I, I urge you to think about, as we talk for the next 50 minutes, about what the definition of a journalist really is. Because in this new age, and for, for the kind of information we're about to get from our panelists, we need to understand that it's a very different environment from certainly 10 years ago, and even from a year or two ago. It's moving very fast in very sinister ways with new platforms and new systems. So, Irene, why didn't you come in? description of what it is really on the ground. I have a daughter who now works for the BBC Reality Check. Is in the tell us about it. Check team. In your, in <laughs> she doesn't tell me much about her work, but we do share, <laughs> of course. But uh, you, Irene Khan, Irene yeah. Khan, you got four uh, minutes. I've got four minutes. So let me start by saying the digital digital technology has transformed the way paradigm shift in how we share information, and you've mentioned it vividly. Uh, what it means for for journalists today, um, audience. The, the definition of a gen, uh, journalist has broadened out enormously. Uh, the lines between audience and journalism uh, has, has been blurred and so on. Um, so the way news is produced, the way we consume it, uh, it's opened up opportunities but huge threats as well. Uh, we don't have time to talk about the opportunities. But, but we can signal them in headline form. Certainly you collect more information, data, data is easier, you're cooperating across borders, investigative journalism is doing things that was never possible before a digital technology came in. But let me, uh, well, let me just highlight a couple of key issues with which we are grappling and which I have uh, put in my various reports and, and cases and so on. Uh, one is, of course, uh, the issue of uh, these coordinated, highly sexualized and malicious attacks, especially targeting women journalists. I know we have Julie Pusetti here, who is a well-known expert in the subject, so I won't go into the details of that. I'm sure she'll cover it. One point I want to make is that those attacks don't happen in isolation. They're very often accompanied, they're part, a component of a much uh, larger and much more damaging strategy against journalists. If you take the case of Maria Ressa, on the one hand, she was being attacked online. On the other hand, she had a barrage of legal claims and prosecution that would have put her in prison if she had been found guilty and all. She, she will be in prison for 100 years. She has one case coming up now at the, in, in December uh, that would put her in prison for about seven years uh, for a tweet, for, for, for a re retweeting uh, a tweet. Uh, so let me go to my second point. As digital threats have grown, so have legal threats. And we need to recognize the way in which legislation that is seeking to address expression, or rather I should say restrict expression online, fake news, counter-terrorism laws, uh, vexatious claims, slaps, are being used against journalists uh, in terrible ways. So not only do states fail to protect journalists, they actually weaponize the law against journalists increasingly. So that's a double whammy there. Now, journalism is not a crime, yet criminal law is being used increasingly against journalists. 
because criminal law is, is, is more terrifying, more intimidating, and the idea is, of course, to restrict this escalation or amplification of news uh, on, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the internet. Uh, and um, there is actually online more harsh punishment than punishment for the same publication uh, in print or broadcast. And then there are cr online cross-border attacks uh, that states or other actors, bad actors, are actually attacking journalists, not on the territory, but from other countries. I, uh, talking about the BBC, last week I was in London talking to the BBC Persian service uh, that has been the victim. The journalists there have been the victim of such online attacks, and they have no remedy. They have no remedy because many governments including the United Kingdom, does not rec recognize extraterritorial responsibility for human rights. So in a digital age where human rights violations are happening extraterritorially, there is no remedy uh, for journalists extraterritorially. Now coming to targeted digital surveillance, which I know P Peggy Hicks will cover, let me say that such surveillance is usually a precursor or a follow-on of physical harm detention, legal harassment, and, and smear campaigns. Uh, and then again, the extraterritorial reach allows states to control expression uh, beyond their jurisdiction, and that often stifles uh, global investigations in, in, of journalism. Uh, Irene, if I could ask you. One to... last point, online disinformation. Now, online disinformation targets journalism, uh, public interest journalism, but online, uh, the strategy the best strategy for tackling online disinformation is actually independent, free, pluralistic, diverse media. So there, uh, media is both a victim of disinformation but also the answer to fighting disinformation. Unfortunately, many governments are interested in addressing disinformation without looking at the issue of media freedom. And that is very dangerous because media then becomes a double victim of state censorship as well as Thank you, Irene. Thank you. I, can I, can I, well, I, I've got time problems. So if you want to get to your lunch with the minister. No, don't go, don't go yet. One word. We started with ministers, and I'm very pleased to hear both. And I have worked with Lithuania. Microphone. And I have worked with Lithuania, and, 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 uh, I'm, and I'm very delighted about the abolition of criminal uh, libel in uh, Sierra Leone. But there is one word that I need I believe needs to be repeated again and again and again in this uh, meeting, and that is the P word of political will. Nothing will work if we do not have political will on the state, on the part of states, but also on the part of large companies. That is absolutely All right. <laughs> Julie, um, uh, uh, we heard from Irene your name first, but what I'd like to do is go to Peggy to prove that I haven't forgotten the people on, down the line. So bear in mind, and she was mentioned last, Peggy Hicks, uh, Director of Thematic Engagement, Special Procedures and Right to Development Division at OCHA. Where are you, Peggy? Um, please come in. I hope I can see you on the platform uh, on the screen. I hope you can see me. We too. can see you. Can go you ahead. Okay. You've got four minutes. Wonderful. So I'm calling and, and I'm coming in from Geneva. Sorry, couldn't be with you, but very happy to be part of this important discussion. You heard your name mentioned, I hope, by Irene a moment ago. I did. I did. And I do want to pick up um, on this issue of spyware and surveillance technology. Our office has been just issued a report in September on that threat. And I think it is an emerging one, one that's incredibly important. So I wanted to say a few words up front about why it's so important and then specifically what needs to be done about it. So we've seen through the Pegasus spyware um, uh, revelations in 2021 that it targeted nearly 200 journalists in 24 countries. But what we know is that's really the tip of the iceberg. More than 500 companies around the world have been identified as providing hacking services of some um, kind of governments. So we really don't even know the extent of the use of these types of spywares. And they are being used specifically against journalists, against human rights defenders, against dissenters in, in all forms. Um, we also shouldn't underestimate the breadth of how um, this has an impact on human rights. It obviously undermines the right to privacy, but it also undermines the right to freedom of thought and, and opinion. When, when 
everything that you do is being spied on, it, it does constrain people's ability to really think for themselves in the ways that they need to. It has an, uh, a traumatic effect on people's mental health. We've heard that from people who have been subjected to spyware. And it, of course, has led to arbitrary arrests, torture, and even extrajudicial killings. So it's a very serious phenomenon. So what we need to talk about then, of course, is, you know, the, the broader impact, not just on the individuals, but on the society and on journalism as a whole, the reality is that those hacking programs are also having a chilling effect on freedom of expression and the work of the media. The Supreme Court of India talked about Pegasus software as being an assault on the vital public watchdog role of the press. So we need to look at how do we respond. And our report um, puts four critical steps that we need governments to take. First and foremost, we need a moratorium on the use and sale of hacking tools like Pegasus until adequate safeguards are put in place. Um, th that is something that governments can and must do, and, and it, it is, is not happening as quickly as it needs to. Secondly, we want to emphasize that states have to avoid taking steps that could weaken end-to-end -end encryption, which is critical for the work of journalists to preserve the confidentiality of their sources and for many reasons. In particular, we're are uh, arguing that they should not mandate so-called backdoors that give access to people's encrypted data or employ systematic screening of people's uh, devices known as client-side scanning. Third, states should be setting export controls on surveillance tools. When assessing requests for export licenses, they should require transparent human rights impact assessments, and those assessments need to take into account the capacities of the technologies at issue as well as the situation of, the hum of human rights in the recipient states. These technologies should certainly not be going to countries where we know that they will be abused and have been abused. And fourth and finally, with regards to the uh, uh, government's responsibilities, we wanna highlight the importance of victims' access to meaningful remedies. Affected journalists and media workers must be able to take governments to court to challenge the use of hacking measures taken against them. And this requires, of course, transparency about spyware that's being used, including rules for notifying targets once, um, uh, once such notifications do not put legitimate investigations in peril. Uh, in peril. And finally, of course, it's not just an issue, as, as Irene has eloquently said, of what we need governments to do, but we also need the companies offering spyware to meet their human rights responsibilities as outlined in the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. They need to publicly commit to meeting those responsibilities and they need to do human rights due diligence uh, in the er earliest uh, stages of project de uh, product development and throughout their operations. And they should regularly issue public transparency reports on the business activities that they have with human rights impacts. All right, Peggy, thank you. Can I, can I pause thank you, you there? Um, Absolutely. Because, because you've given us a shopping list, and I'm hoping to hear from Ian Levine, who's senior human rights advisor for Meta. And Ian, I hope you're coming down the line from somewhere. Uh, I think you're on the, actually the East Coast, is it? Um, but I, you've, you've got up to join us. But I'd like your response to those four points that Peggy made. But let me now go to uh, Julie, first of all. Uh, you used to be a journalist, now, Still a journalist, um, but but a researcher, um, and I lead global research at the International Centre for Journalists (ICFJ), uh, and I've done quite a bit of work for uh, UNESCO and the OSCE on the issue that I think you're going to ask me about. <laughs> you're going to tell me your answer. Okay, so so I um, I have led uh, for the past three years um, a global study on gender-based online violence, and so I'm going to focus uh, my intervention uh, on that issue. And the first thing I want to say is that there is nothing virtual about online violence. It does not stay online. It inflicts real physical harm, and most importantly, it aids and abets impunity. The platforms are the main vectors. And political actors, including states, increasingly instigate and amplify online violence towards women journalists, including in an extraterritorial way. So where we see foreign state actors entering uh, the fray. Now, these statements uh, are not just advocacy. They are supported by this uh, three-year research project I mentioned, which was commissioned by UNESCO and led by ICFJ. And this week, that project culminated with the publication of The Chilling, a global study of online violence against women journalists, which is freely available uh, to download at ICFJ. It is a book-length study, which gives you a, an indication of how serious and widespread this problem is. 
It covers 15 countries uh, and it reflects the voices of over 850 women journalists whom we've surveyed and interviewed. And it also presents analysis of millions of social media posts targeting women journalists. Um, you've heard the 73% of women journalists uh, who uh, experience online violence in the course of their work quoted extensively. That comes from this research. Some of the other statistics I want to share with you because they give us a concrete handle on uh, the experiences of the women who get targeted when they are at the core of, of an online violence storm. 41% of those women we surveyed experienced online violence in the context of what they believe to be an orchestrated disinformation campaign. So these threats are absolutely interlaced. 37% said they identified political actors as top <coughs> perpetrators of online violence. The most frequently reported consequence was mental health impacts and psychological injury, and psychological injury must be recognised as a real harm. It is a workplace safety issue at the very least. 20% of the women surveyed in a shocking statistic said they had experienced offline harassment, abuse and attacks that they connected to the online violence they endured. Online violence radiates. It targets not just the woman, um, who is being specifically targeted, but also um, their family members, their colleagues, their sources, and it does not stay online, it moves offline. So we can now correlate online violence with offline harm, from physical assault through to lawfare, which is the term that Maria Ressa uses to describe the way in which online violence directed at her has created an enabling environment for her persecution and prosecution. And in some of the most serious cases, we can point to causation. I mean, my cheeks are still tear-stained from hearing that testimony via an actor this morning of Daphne Caruana Galizia's son, um, you know, after she was blown, blown to pieces uh, in a car bomb. But her murder did not come out of the blue. It followed years of online violence on Facebook, which created this enabling environment ultimately for Daphne's assassination. That's according to her legal team, but it's also been acknowledged by the public inquiry into her death. And as I mentioned with Maria Ressa, so severe is the online violence she has experienced that her Daphne Caruana Galizia's sons have raised the alarm saying that there are too many parallels between her case and Daphne's case. And so we can see the way um, impunity cases themselves give us evidence uh, for the risk that is being faced by other women journalists around the world. Now, Maria could be in jail before the year's out because she has lost an appeal and she's now continuing to appeal to the Supreme Court over a criminal cyber libel charge. She features in this study as a major case study and we have been able to trace the hashtag Arrest Maria Ressa, which was first seeded in 2019, which eventually became viral. And then, of course, two years later, she was, in fact, arrested. Now, I just want to point out as well that in terms of action, we have to respond to that specific threat of online violence escalation um, meaningfully. And one of the things we've recommended is the need for the development of an early warning system to try to um, monitor, predict and ultimately prevent the escalation of online violence. And we're working on that with colleagues at the University of Sheffield uh, with the assistance of the UK Foreign Office. Um, and the other thing that's absolutely essential is developing indicators for online violence escalation to help us monitor these abuses and to factor them in to these warning systems. And we're doing that with OSCE currently and we have some draft indicators on the stage. I'd be really keen for you to take those and to provide some input into them. And the last point I would like to make is that we cannot continue to dismiss these digital threats, the online violence, and it is violence, um, you know, there's this a specific reason we're using the term violence and not just abuse and harassment because it manifests in ways that um, are parallel with violence. We can't continue to dismiss it as a peripheral issue. And I think it's unfortunate, frankly, that digital issues and specifically those that most intersect with gender are effectively in the back room of this discussion. Um, and the, one of the big problems we have with the existing UN plan of action uh, is that digital isn't even mentioned and that gender is an afterthought. And I'm going to leave it there. Thank you, Julie.
much, much appreciate that. I'm sorry I've got to move on. Nigad, why didn't you come in and uh, pick up, particularly on what Irene said, mentioned your work? Yeah, uh, so um, you, in the beginning, you mentioned about unfortunate attack on the former uh, prime minister of Pakistan. And, uh, and it's very unfortunate. No one uh, should experience such kind of attacks. But I also would like to state that uh, when heads of the states, when governments are the ones who make bad laws uh, and who violate media freedoms, I think we also need to remind ourselves who are the ones making these laws. And um, here I'm uh, referencing to the cybercrime law in Pakistan. Uh, also, there are other uh, laws that are uh, proposed uh, in the last few years not to regulate um, uh, social media companies, although the intention uh, is being shown that it's to hold companies accountable, but underneath, it's actually uh, to hold users, politi uh, uh, political descendants, journalists, and activists uh, accountable and prosecute. Um, it's uh, uh, the... Uh, Credit goes to the civil society organizations who are working not only in Pakistan, around the world with very less resources where the resources are being banned through different legislative frameworks by the states. Even then, they are working towards uh, making good laws. Pakistan had made a headway to a, pro uh, to a law which is around the protection of journalists. Uh, it's a good law with some ambiguous provisions which still gives uh, um, uh, ambiguous powers to the state. But at the same time, I feel that uh, organizations like uh, Freedom Network, my colleagues are here, they have also uh, presented some report, uh, Digital Rights Foundation addressing issue of online violence against women journalists specifically. There have been some uh, 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 progress. But at the same time, um, I listened to the conversation yesterday around uh, social media platforms. And yes, we have many problems with the platforms around their non-responsiveness uh, 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 around the issues that Julie has mentioned or Irene has mentioned. But at the same time, I think we also need to look at the solutions that have have been proposed uh, uh, um, in in uh, last couple of years, and uh, uh, while I head Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan, I all, I'm also a member of uh, Matters Independent Oversight Board, which is uh, uh, you know it's one example of a company transferring decision-making power on content <coughs> moderation to an external uh, independent body of experts in a way that prioritizes users' rights and delinks such decisions from the financial interests of the uh, business um, and definitely CEOs of these tech companies shouldn't make decisions around content moderations the way we are seeing with one platform which has been now owned by the billionaire um, just want to mention the important decisions that we have made uh, and they are, they are very specific and may, many people don't know uh, maybe about this but we have looked into multiple cases that are relevant uh, in one case related to protest in Colombia the, the board expanded the expose of newsworthiness and decided that it is not just journalists that share content uh, that share content which may be newsworthy. There are other people that you have also mentioned. Um, an extra care should be given by the uh, by the Facebook and Instagram to avoid undue censorship of uh, newsworthy content and matters uh, related to public interest. Uh, there is one case related to news report on the Taliban and uh, groups associated with Hamas. The board has said that rules on news reporting on uh, terrorist organizations that um, uh, some governments, uh, foreign governments, have uh, uh, have a list around uh, these banned and terrorist organizations. Those rules must be made clear. The current policies uh, in the companies were leading to unnecessary uh, censorship of content and suspension of journalist accounts in the region. We saw this a lot in Pakistan, Afghanistan, when the whole conflict uh, started in Afghanistan. Another very important point while we are talking about governments is government requests to remove content uh, should be made available publicly. That's what board has asked Meta to do. Uh, disproportionate or undue censorship, uh, we believe that contribute to a climate of misinformation and affect users' right to access to information and share opinions. And we have said this to the company, that users have an interest in knowing what kinds of content government and states are seeking to remove uh, from the company. So that should be made uh, transparent. All right. And what I'm going to say is, uh, given Time is relatively short, but we do have Ian from uh, Meta lined yeah. up. 
So that list of what I'm going to put to him is getting quite long. So can we just pause for a moment? Sure. Because and the reason I mentioned uh, Imran Khan, of course, was because he immediately blamed the ISI. He's, he immediately blamed the military for what happened, for being behind what happened yesterday. Yeah, yeah, but we also should not forget when, when, uh, when the same uh, heads of the state work with the deep state to suppress, uh, uh, you know, civil society organizations and media freedom. Understood. So we, we really uh, need to keep that in mind as well. All right, we have 20 minutes to run. Clemens, um, welcome. Thanks for your patience, President of the European Alliance of News Agencies. Uh, Ian, I haven't forgotten you, but uh, I think it's only fair that we come to you at the end because a number of points need to be picked up and I hope you can in relatively short order. Thank you very much Nick. I really appreciate your approach to define the issue and topic not only on journalists but also on journalism. So you tried to redefine that there are media outlets, information builders and I want to bring in the perspective of news agencies. So why I'm doing this, welcome to Vienna. You are not only in the city of Sigmund Freud, you are also in the city and in the country which is directly or indirectly connected to two world wars. I'm telling this because I'm Austrian, I'm chief executive of Austrian news agency APA, vice president of Swiss news agency and as Nick mentioned, president of European Alliance of news agencies. What does this uh, tackle our topic today? Because Regarding the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine, it showed us again one clear picture. It's us media, it's us news agencies to be attacked first. Every war is at an early stage always a war on information and a propaganda war. And it's like a magnifying glass if you look at those situations. First, the democratic light is put off. We as media are put off always first. Second, noise irritating to those at power is put off. This means opposition is taken away. Look at Russia, Navalny and so on. The third thing is independent judiciary goes under state control. Why is all this so important for us? to repeat and to repeat and to repeat again. Because up to two-thirds, up to two-thirds of daily media coverage all over Europe, print, online, apps, TV, radio, originates directly or indirectly from news agencies. But no, not many people know about news agencies. News agencies are B2B workers. They are working behind. They have no direct media outlets. But regarding that only 20 out of 140 news, world, uh, news agencies worldwide, only 20 out of 140 are independent news agencies. So you have very few independent news agencies with a maximum impact on the media and communication system. And that's a problem in the meantime. That's a problem because out of those 20, for example, the in regarding Europe, the Scandinavian countries are independent, have independent news agencies, German-speaking countries, UK with PA media, uh, US with Associated Press or Canada with uh, CP uh, or India also. Japan. Um, and in this organization of EANA, at least for Europe, we try to bring together all those news agencies. There are independent news agencies, state-owned news agencies, and as EANA, we try to be the United Nations of European news agencies because there are so many different role models and so many different approaches uh, to the topic of uh, what they are delivering for the media system. Clemens, we understand, I think, now better, and thank you for doing that, but can I encourage you in your last two minutes to just highlight the challenges you see? The challenges, of course, and I'm reflecting on the, on the system, the challenges are, of course, protecting journalists, the situation in Western Europe is not so bad as the many examples from the other rest of the world, that's uh, openly to be said. But we have the, the situation of building up legal frameworks to protect journalism, 
slaps have already been mentioned. And in my opinion, we have to bring media and news agencies in a solid financial situation so that they can act freely. They can decide on their own what is editorial coverage and what is not. This is the most important thing, aside bringing a legal framework regarding Europe uh, with uh, 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 EU Commission for having a legal framework regarding the interaction between media and the platforms. These are one of the most uh, important topics to safeguard journalism in Europe. One example, or two examples, 60 news agencies out of Europe did some weeks ago a joint newsroom in Brussels. They share space, they share knowledge, they share education. They do backing each other. There are state-owned and independent news agencies. And the second thing, just a few days ago, we launched for the German-speaking countries the biggest initiative, the biggest joint venture for independent fact-checking. Fact-checking does not mean only that in your own editorial service you do check, recheck and double-check, you should do anyway. Fact-checking is a single new discipline in editorial newsrooms. It means to pick up from the online world informations and to check them if they are right or if they are wrong. So Do you think the plan of action recognizes this adequately? Who is recognizing? The UN plan of action. Do you think, do you think the plan of action understands the enormity the uh, seismic change which is taking place. No, I think uh, uh, the role of news agencies is totally underestimated in every plan. All right, well, we'll plan. put that forward. Thank you very much indeed. I know it was rather brief, but I wanted to get to the root of that, particularly that last point. Now, Ian, um, wherever you are, um, thank you for being patient, but you can see why I've left you to the end as senior human rights advisor for Meta. Um, I, I hope you're there. Can I, can I see Ian? Assuming he I'm is there. Here. You are good. Okay. Uh, I, can good I can hear you. I can now York. see you. Can I just remind you that certain things have been said. The non-responsiveness uh, to solutions proposed. There's guarantees that there's not undue censorship. G what about government requests to remove content? Uh, and uh, we heard there the request. Let's ask Meta on that. So those are the kind of issues we've put up. Uh, here uh, in Vienna for you. What are your responses to these kind of uh, real concerns? Um, thank, thank, thanks, uh, Nick and, and, and the organizers. It's, it's good to be here and it's good to have a chance to engage with the issues raised and to, I'll try and respond as, as best I can to some of the very specific questions raised. Um, maybe just to start with a couple of kind of important framing um, points. I think the the, the, the argument you made at the very beginning, Nick, about the speed of change is extraordinarily important. There's, there's an Isaac Asimov quote that uh, I often think about uh, underpinning this, this, this whole challenge we have, not just on journalism, but human rights in the digital world more generally, where he said, and this was 40 years ago, he said that science advances knowledge far more quickly than society acquires wisdom. Well, how, uh, how, fast is, uh, how fast is meta advancing then, please? Well, we're doing as, as, as best we can in the, the, the creation of the human rights team, the creation of uh, the adoption of the human rights policy, a lot of work done across trust and safety and journalist safety. Uh, th there's, a, there's a real commitment there. The second point I want to address is one you made at the very beginning, which I think is hugely important, and that's the evolving nature of journalism and journalists. And the need to think carefully about how we protect journalism through protecting freedom of expression and addressing safety issues while recognize, recognizing that definitions are, are evolving. Uh, um, journalists, citizen journalists, activists, human rights defenders face a lot of very similar issues and overlapping issues. Um, and we are very committed to, to, to safety of all users because we know that unless we are, are protecting all users, uh, we're very unlikely to be protecting citizen journalists, journalists um, uh, and human rights activists, while recognizing obviously that journalists are a particularly important group, both because they are more likely to be attacked and, and uh, both online and offline, as, as, as Julie pointed out, um, than, than many others, but also because our ability to support them and protect their work 
I've got to move you quite fast, Ian. I'm sorry about that. We, we're running over time. But let me put uh, another point, which, I've, which I'm repeating from two minutes ago, that there's not undue censorship, what we heard from Nikat, particularly this uh, government requests about removing content. She wanted Meta to be asked about that. In other words, how often do you actually comply with the government saying, we don't want you to be publishing that? When, when governments ask us to take down uh, uh, posts, we have to, uh, by virtue of our membership of the Global Network Initiative, we have to put that request or that demands through three tests. We look at it against national law. We look at it against community standards, our community standards, the rules that say what you can and cannot say on the platform. And we put it through the lens of international human rights law. And only uh, uh, we would only take the content down if it uh, if it if it uh, violates community standards and, and and human rights law, which very much informs our, our, our community standards. Now um, another I, uh, another point that was made much earlier in the discussion: the non-responsiveness, and I'm quoting the question here, to solutions which are being proposed in this area, and the fact that you're slow on this. We, we have something like 40,000 people working on safety and security issues. Uh, uh, we, we're working really hard uh, on advancing our human rights policy and the commitments we've made there in human rights due diligence. There is always room for improvement. There is always a need to do more. Um, but we're certainly engaged in these issues, committed to these issues. We're extremely committed to seeing the rights of all users uh, respected. And recognizing, Nick, and this is a hugely important point to make, that we recognize that freedom of expression, which lies at the heart of our community standards and which lies at the heart of the whole purpose of Meta's platforms is only going to be ensured if we are able to protect privacy through end-to-end -end encryption, as Peggy pointed out in, in her remarks, and protect the safety of users. All and right. when we fail to protect women journalists, when we fail to protect LGBTQ communities, racial and religious minorities, human rights defenders, we're clearly not living up to a commitment to protect their freedom of expression. Right, so Ian, we've got, we've, got, we've got 10 minutes to run. Can I get the microphones? Would anyone like to come in um, uh, immediately? Uh, get the microphone to you now so we can use the time most effectively. Put your hand up or piece, piece of paper, whatever. I, I just want to ask one other thing. Uh, Ian, you are accused quite, and I'm summarizing here, of complacency and evasiveness. Uh, a matter or me personally? No. <laughs> I wasn't going to get that personal. You're among friends here. I, 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 look, I've been with the company for two years. I came to the company after many, many years working at human rights organizations. I do not see complacency. Um, I am surrounded by people who are working really hard to address these issues. Do we always succeed? Of course not. This is an incredibly complex, difficult uh, uh, environment we're operating at massive scale. Uh, and we're all, all of us, governments, NGOs, activists, the UN system, we're facing unprecedented threats. But complacency, I do not recognize. All right, I don't see any hands going up here. So Nikad and Julie. Yeah, just, uh, I, I think we also need to acknowledge among all the companies, it's Meta, which uh, established the independent oversight board. We have given more than 100 uh, recommendations. Among them, 70% are partially or fully implemented by the company. It's also the company that sort of comes to the panel and face really hard questions. I think we re really need to acknowledge what, who are the other companies, especially coming from China. You know, are they part of the conversations where they are? And they are also the perpetrators when it comes to online violence right. against we'll, we'll leave that idea hanging, Julie. Yes, no, I think it's very important. I really appreciate Ian's interventions and I would encourage you, Ian, to um, reach out to me because you certainly were there when uh, one of the cases that features in this book involving a brutally targeted uh, Northern Ireland journalist, Trish Devlin, who has had the police at her door warning her that she's about to be imminently assassinated, has had graffiti on walls in Belfast. She, she reports on uh, paramilitary operations, has been targeted on Facebook, and I personally... Um, in an email exchange with some of your colleagues, with UNESCO in copy, tried to intervene to get uh, this p threat to rape her baby investigated uh, via messenger. And I got obfuscation and denial and deflection and PR. It didn't come from you. Ian was not on that email chain. But there are disconnects that need to be addressed. And I also echo um, my gratitude that you come here to say this. And now we have a whole other challenge with Twitter <laughs> uh, essentially abolishing the processes that Facebook has thankfully put 
put in place, but we really need to work harder and faster at breaching the disconnects. Has anyone got Elon Musk's email breaching. address? Um, okay, and now, Ian, do you want to respond to any of that? Because I've got a couple of other questions from the audience as well. Because uh, I have, and I don't know if Peggy's just, still just there. Just one thing, maybe just one thing to say, and I should have said it in my first remarks, so I'm glad I just have the opportunity to say how important the role of the Oversight Board is. Its decisions and its recommendations are hugely important. They are very carefully studied and, and looked at. My team, the human rights team, goes through them very carefully, especially the human rights standards that they cite in every decision and recommendation. So I just want to say it's been a hugely important step forward, uh, and it's a critical tool for holding us accountable um, and ensuring that we fix stuff that we get wrong. And of course, we get things wrong. So and it's I fair to say to the process that. is evolving all the time. OK, I've got one question here. Peggy, do you need to come in? Are you still there? If you, if you do, you better shout, because I can't see you. Thank I, you. I, am, I am still here. All right, do, do you want to say anything? Just want to echo the point about uh, company to company. There's a lot of attention on Meta, and they deserve that attention. But we need to talk about everybody in the space. You've mentioned Twitter, but let's talk about Google and YouTube as well. Um, the issues of um, moderating content on uh, video content is all the more difficult, but all the more important, all right. uh, given what we're doing. And that applies to TikTok and other short form formats as well. All Thank right, you. let me check. Anyone from Google or TikTok who'd like to speak here? No one here. OK, so I tried, Peggy. All right. <clears throat> Thank Please. you. This is Iqbal Khatak uh, from Pakistan. I'm heading a civil liberty organization, Freedom Network. We are helping the digital journalists in Pakistan. And one of their issues is that the Facebook, from Facebook, they face challenges while distributing their content. Uh, they don't understand about the, about the challenges, why their content is not shared, their content doesn't reach the audience they want to. I would like to hear from the Facebook uh, for the Meta official as to what they can do to work with this Pakistani young digital journalist. All right, uh, Ian, quickly, and then I've got another question, please. Ian, did you hear that uh, question? I, I, look, I, I can't comment on the individual uh, accounts in, 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 the, in a particular country as to why their reach is, is, is not going where they want, but if, if someone wants to share my email with the, with the questioner, um, I'll be happy to follow up. And you'll up do the please. same with, um, with uh, Julie as well on Northern Ireland. Absolutely. Thank you. Another question here, please. Uh, say Hi. who you are, please. My name is Cristina Zahar. I am an executive director of the Brazilian Association of, for Investigative Journalism. I'd like to ask you um, why it is so hard to take down content, misinformation content, and regarding, for instance, these smear, uh, smear campaigns um, towards journalists? Ian. Um, thank you. Um, Brazil has is, is been a huge priority for us, especially with the recent elections. I've been part of a very, very large group that's been working um, on Brazil, and we recognize that misinformation, especially spread by, by WhatsApp, is, is, is a huge challenge. Um, we have taken down, I, I don't remember numbers offhand, I mean tens and tens of thousands of, of misinformation uh, posts, but recognize that it's a huge challenge. Um, and I know from Patricia Campos Mello's book, uh, which I read, Gabinete Dodio, um, it continues to be a, a, a big challenge for us going forward. But we absolutely recognize Brazil as a top priority for misinformation and for its use against women journalists as being a top priority. Clemens, um, do you have an interface, a clear interface between your work as a news agency and what is coming out of uh, Facebook and Meta? Yeah, there are... Microphone. There are a lot of dimensions between news agencies or media outlets uh, and the platforms. Uh, the one is uh, neighboring rights, of course. Uh, it's about uh, money. Uh, the perspective on this topic is to ensure that uh, newsrooms and media outlets get paid for their content regarding it's uh, published also on, on the big platforms. This is not only about Facebook, it's about Google, it's about everything. And this should ensure that Every news agency, every media outlet is able to pay the journalists. It's totally basic and the major aim is to have a clear and closed rights chain. The second thing is, us as news agencies and also the Austrian news agency is doing a lot of fact-checking regarding right. Meta. All right, so um, I'm, I'm summarizing this, Ian. Content has a value and you have to respect that. Um, yeah, the, the whole the issue of relationships between platforms and new agencies payments is way beyond my 
area of work, so I, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to comment on that. But I'm but glad it's a, it's that the, the point about people... third-party fact-checking is mentioned. I mean, we do work with hundreds um, of third-party fact-checkers, many of which are news agencies, precisely to address the misinformation problem, which several speakers ha have addressed. So absolutely recognize that as being fundamental. Maybe you're worth considering that if people have information, the human right is to give it a value and to give it proprietal rights as well. I leave that thought with you. We're not going to get very far on that, but I leave a thought building on what Clement said. Who's got the microphone there? Last question, and then Julie wants a word. Yeah, hi. I'm Christian from the Asian Institute of Journalism and Communication from Manila, Philippines. So same with Brazil. The, the social media played an important role in the recent elections. Now, my question is, even if we do fact-checking the journalism profession, there is now a survey that it is a low time low, a year, uh, all time low, the trust with journalists or journalism as a profession versus vloggers. I don't know if you know the term vloggers, but in Manila, people listen or even trust vloggers or YouTube creators, TikTok creators, rather than journalists like us. So, so the question? My question is, how do we now regain the trust and what can be the role of Meta YouTube or Google, TikTok in this regard. All right, we're almost out of time, but Ian, I'll come to you in a moment. The value, um, Clemence as well, uh, that's, that's an important issue about, about what people are watching and what value they want to put on it. Absolutely, it's a great disaster because I guess around about 20% of uh, population worldwide is still not connected uh, to traditional media and it's a legacy system problem. It's not only referred to media, also to science regarding the COVID pandemic situation. 20% of population and voters does not read anymore, does not trust anymore, not only the media. I guess it's a problem of all legacy systems, media, politics and science. Um, it's also the whole media crisis should not only be addressed towards the platforms and so ever. It's also self-criticism necessary. We have to make ourselves absolutely more transparent how we are working. What is the benefit? For decades, journalism was defining what journalism is or doing and how it is working. So this is about being vulnerable. Absolutely, and in the, in the last years we see as uh, media institutions and media outlets, we have uh, to, to, to bring in also the audience, uh, uh, not only in our product, but also in the way how we define journalism. And the second thing is, I guess, we have not only to produce for TikTok, we have to get a totally new understanding how to attract younger audiences for news media products. Okay, Julie, last word. Yes. <laughs> um, it's very important, however, to recognise that as much as journalism needs to take and journalists need to take uh, an introspective look at their practice, you cannot solve the crisis that we have, whether it's network disinformation <coughs> or gender-based violence, and the two of them constantly intertwine. You cannot solve that problem through excellent practice and openness and transparency alone. That's because algorithmic power drowns out credible content. Algorithmic power drives hate. Algorithmic power does not recognise misogyny as hate speech, and that is one of the things that we have to come to grips with. Hate speech is not a human right at the international level, and one of the issues we have is that US-based companies have determined um, over time that this, what we're talking about, counters free speech. Very problematic. More importantly, states have an obligation now, democratic, liberal states concerned about the rule of law, concerned about the maintenance of democracy in unprecedented times, have an obligation to regulate, to ensure that these problems are able to be managed in a rights-respecting way. And there has been much movement in recent years on that, but much more work needs to be done. One final point, it's all very well for platforms, and I'm not just speaking here about Facebook because it is prolific, read the study and you'll see it goes across the board, to say we are committed to human rights and we are committed to addressing a situation where a woman is being threatened with rape on a daily basis, where her baby is being threatened with rape, where she is being threatened to be blown up with a car just like her friend Daphne Caruana Galizia. We can 
cannot see those problems addressed as they occur all around the world when these big companies operate largely in English and do not have a capacity to work in a contextual way within the countries that they operate. That needs to be addressed. These are multi-billion dollar companies that are facilitating this crisis and we need to do better on that. And Ian, if you're still there. <clears throat> You can hear applause, but um, do you accept the need for more regulation? And it's a point that Pe Peggy made, I think. Uh, more, more regulation as a way of moving forward on this. And the second thing, having asked uh, Clemence about vulnerability, is humility an important part of taking this forward, understanding the, the, the new gaps in your ability to handle this? Ian. Um, uh, pe pe as Peggy, Peggy has heard me say this many times, we worked together for many years, humility is the most undervalued trait in the human rights world, and yes, it is absolutely essential, especially for the big companies like Meta, we have to uh, uh, approach these issues in a, in a spirit of, of humility as well as genuine commitment. Can I just say two things? Um, I think the, the question that was raised earlier about uh, about uh, why people don't trust media as opposed to kind of new vloggers and others. Uh, we're living in an age of denial of truth, of science, of facts, of objectivity. We see this around climate change. We see this around COVID. It's a huge societal problem. I think it's way bigger than, than the social media platforms, but obviously we are part of that ecosystem and it's a hugely important of the discussion as we go forward around journalism and talking about journalist safety. On the issue of algorithmic power, obviously can't get into a whole debate now at the very end, but I do want to say misogyny, hate speech are prohibited on the platform and, and, uh, and we're very clear a, about that. Uh, uh, and we're not creating systems that drive prohibited and unacceptable and inflammatory speech. Um, that's not what, what we uh, right. we need to want to do. And the last question on context, I hear the concern about the fact that we are not um, as resourced as we need to be in 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 in, in languages beyond uh, beyond English and so on. But we 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 are working uh, with content moderating capacity in many languages. We're increasingly investing resources in high priority countries for us around the world: Ethiopia, Myanmar, Afghanistan. Uh, Ukraine, Brazil, and so on. Uh, do we need to do more? Of course, always. Um, but the idea that we're indifferent to the human rights risks uh, on our platform around the world, the need to engage with trusted partners, the need to engage with third party fact checkers to make sure that our content moderation decisions are contextualized. We, 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 are, we know we need to do this and we're doing an awful lot around that, but I recognize we don't have any more time, so thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, you'll probably be getting a lot of job applications from uh, Twitter um, in the coming, coming days and weeks. So there's, there's capacity and they've already been trained. So um, you'll be able to offer them good jobs if you've got the, if you've got the budget. Peggy, last word. I'm told you, you feel a bit forgotten out there in Geneva, but I haven't <laughs> forgotten you. Uh, last word, because then we have to wrap. Great. No, I just want to pick up that point. I think Ian has said that they want to do better in other contexts and other languages, but the real question there is how much are they investing in it? It's a huge company. We need to understand whether that investment is at the right level. I don't believe it is yet. And I think, you know, that's not within the human rights office that, that Ian works in decision making power, but we need all the companies to know if they're doing business someplace, there is a minimum level of investment that's necessary. That's the point Irene Khan has made. And the second thing I'd say in terms of Julie's points about the need for regulation, absolutely regulation is needed, but I want to um, say that it should focus on one of the key points that hasn't come up is around transparency and the need for access to data for researchers to be able to really understand how we solve these problems. I understand the concerns about the algorithms, but the reality is that it's very complex to be able to, to solve that problem and do it in a way that doesn't suppress speech that we want to be protected. And we are concerned that when we see states jumping in to regulate this space, the vast majority of regulation we see is actually overbroad and suppressing speech and dissent and the types of things that journalists depend on to be able to do their jobs as well. So we need to get it right. That means transparency is key and we have to do the regulation in the right way. Thank you. All right. Can I, can I say uh, one last comment? Very, very briefly. I think the real test of matter is that we have 
given them a recommendation to translate their community guidelines into regional languages, local languages, and one was Punjabi, which, is, which has been spoken by 200 billion people, uh, 2 billion people around the world. So they are looking into that recommendation, and definitely they have to look into other ro uh, uh, local languages as well. One point that I really want to make is that it's good that we are criticizing company, rightly so, we have to, but at the same time, the disinformation and misinformation being spread by the heads of the state, by, with millions of followers, the ministers, the political leaders, the way that information travels and the way they uh, spread abuse and hate against journalists, especially women journalists, and the misogyny that they spread, I think we really need to hold that, them accountable. That opens a door to a massive issue which Clemens would want to talk about, about validation and the danger of uh, the people you're dealing with, mostly anonymously. Anyway, I have to stop it now. We've overrun by about 40 minutes. Uh, lunch is still waiting, so you're not going to go hungry. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and do please, do, do please take some very clear um, issues away with you because I think we put them on the agenda for you. Can I just urge you also to take one of these documents? Those of you who work on the safety of women journalists might be particularly interested. Uh, it's a set of draft indicators for understanding how online violence escalates to offline harm and gives guidance on monitoring. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Record.